Ned, we know consciousness is very important for our self-understanding as human beings. You've made the interesting observation that if consciousness is real, as opposed to being an illusion, which some people think, and it is scientific, that those two concepts have some difficulty in, in being meshed together. It's not so comfortable putting those two together. Why is that? Well, the way, I think the way to see this is um, thinking about a silicon isomorph of us, a being who acts like us, um, but uh, about whom there is a question of, of, of whether the being is really conscious. There was a, a television program, uh, uh, the second Star Trek series, that involved an example of this, Commander Data, mm -hmm. uh, a robot um, um, uh, made to behave pretty much like a, like a human, but um, uh, made in an entirely different way. And one of the, one of the um, uh, programs was one in which the uh, issue uh, came up as to whether he was property and could be taken apart. They'd lost the plans. No one knew how he was made. And um, there was some thought that they could maybe discover it by disassembling him. Of course, they didn't know whether they could reassemble him. And so there was a trial in this program. About, uh, and the issue in the trial was really, was Commander Data conscious? Um, and what that reveals to us when we think about that question is how in the world we could possibly tell if consciousness is something real then there should there is a real question as to whether commander data is conscious but nothing in the science of the mind that we have found or that we can even conceive of finding can tell us the answer we might be able to do to understand the the uh, biological basis of human consciousness and that understanding may not give us a metric which could apply to commander data. So the <laughs> assumption that, that, that consciousness is real and a real scientific quantity raises a conundrum of um, how we would ever apply that real scientific um, um, substrate to another being. You've called this the harder problem that's of right. consciousness. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Now, how does that distinguish from the hard problem? Okay, the hard problem is the problem of how the neural basis of a conscious state, or why the neural basis of a conscious state is the neural basis of that conscious state as opposed to some other conscious state, red as opposed to green, or nothing at all. Yeah, and, and that, that strictly as in, it refers to one individual and their right. internal that's experience. Right. So we can, have, we can think of that hard problem in terms of just I can think of it just in terms of me. Right. So the thought is that it's a problem about me, but there's this other problem about other creatures. And the other problem, I think, may in, may in some ways be harder because you can think of a solution to the hard problem that allows us to understand us humans, but doesn't allow us to um, apply it to another creature. Uh, how do you look on the problem of consciousness, having dealt with it for much of your career as a philosopher, in terms of its fundamental meaning. Is this as, uh, is this as significant as, as many people think? Well, yes, I mean, I think it certainly is significant in terms of our motivation for doing things. We like some conscious states, we don't <laughs> like others. Um, it's part of what it makes, what it means to be a person. Um, People tend to take consciousness, and some people would, in, in, in your terminology, inflate it, mm -hmm. and some people would deflate it. Yeah. Uh, I, I think you've been accused maybe sometimes in both directions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more accused of the inflation okay. variety. Yeah, I think some people respond to the um, difficulty of solving the hard problem and the harder problem by saying that consciousness is an illusion. That's the deflationary view. Mm -hmm. The view that consciousness can be analyzed in terms of um, cognition, um, say higher order thought, or in terms of function, or in terms of representation. Those are the deflationary views, the views that try to analyze consciousness away in terms of something else. And make it less than it appears. Yes. That consciousness is, is really, yeah. in reality, is less than it appears. Yeah, Dan Dennett is fond of saying <laughs> that uh, there is some, the consciousness exists, but it isn't what you think. <laughs> now, what do you think, and why are you accused of being an inflationist? Because I, I don't believe those views. I think consciousness is something real, something important to us, and that there really is a scientific question as to what it is in us, and a real scientific question as to what it is in other creatures. But I do have to admit that it, the problem of how you would ever tell, especially about other creatures, does strain the conceptual system a bit. 
So I don't completely rule out the idea that somebody like Dennett could be right. Um, uh, so far, I don't, I don't see much in it, but um, some future Dennett may have a better version of those um, deflationary arguments. So in trying to search for meaning in consciousness, some would really expand it and use consciousness as a, a, as a window of seeing other worlds, or whether it's spirit worlds or immaterial worlds, or consciousness being an irreducible force of nature. Mm -hmm. You don't see that kind of meaning in consciousness. Um, I think that um, given that we don't understand what consciousness is in the brain, it makes it reasonable to try out crazy <laughs> theories uh, because um, um, when you don't know what to do, it's always worth uh, a try. And the idea that consciousness might be the fifth force or something like that um, <laughs> seems to me to be worth uh, thinking about. But as with, with all of those cr wild and crazy ideas, they're a long shot. So none of them looks like it's getting anywhere now. Well, if we look at classical dualism, uh, one may say today that that's a crazy idea, but certainly it, it was for the vast majority of human history, uh, the, the common assumption and the, uh, uh, the, 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 the mainstream thinking that everybody have, and indeed common people w would have it today without, they really don't, don't get into the science or really don't think about it much at all. So is there any credence that we put in the common human perception historically and and personally, that, that there is some immaterial factor that has to be considered? Well, what's happened in the course of history, especially recent history, is all the locuses of immateriality, except consciousness, have disappeared, the most important one being life. Mm -hmm. People thought that life required a miracle. Um, you know, no one understood how um, uh, the same creature could be reproduced over and over and over again. Um, without um, a loss of information. Um, you know, the way a zero, you, you take a Xerox and Xerox and Xerox and Xerox and Xerox and the Xerox, and what you get is a, a, a very degraded copy after 50 or 100 generations. But we have many animals where we can observe the um, uh, 100 generations and we see that they make perfect copies. Um, so that's better. <laughs> right. Um, so that was considered a mystery until people understood the mechanisms of DNA. So I, I wouldn't um, uh, jump from, we don't understand it today, to it can't be understood. <laughs>